Um, good morning, everybody. As you've just heard, my name is uh, Jimmy Nelson, and I work as a photographer. Firstly, I'd like to say how fantastic it is to be here today in front of you all, especially as I live around the corner for the last 15 years, and I would have never in my wildest dreams have expected to stand here before you. I'm going to take you on a journey, so sit back for the next 12 minutes and enjoy. Where are we? Where am I, more to the point? I'm in far northern Mongolia, on the border of Russia, in the middle of winter. And I'm cold. I'm struggling. I'm lost. I'm lonely. I'm isolated. I'm disorientated. And to be honest, I've essentially lost track of what I was trying to do. My intention was to photograph the Satan. And the Satan are reindeer herders in northern Mongolia. And they're one of the last group of indigenous cultures that live there. But for one reason or another, my intention and the wish I, and the way I wanted to photograph them is just not succeeding. I cannot connect. It's impossible. So invariably, every night, we ended up in a teepee, everybody sleeping and e eating around one another. And they often offered me vodka. And I'm a little bit of a prude, as I'm not uh, too uh, good with alcohol. But that night, I said, bring it on. So I started. And before I knew it, I was wildly drunk, but it was heaven. I was warm. And I fell into a deep alcoholic coma. Middle of the night, full bladder. I'm sure most of us have experienced it before. I need the loo, but I could hear this raging blizzard going on outside. And like all these 30 sleeping Saturn around me, and I didn't want to wake them. So I thought, I'm smart. I'm drunk, but I'll be OK. So I'm going to roll discreetly to the side, to the side of the tent. I'm going to lift it up and have a little bit of a pee outside. I'm not, not going to wake anybody. So off I went on my alcoholic journey. Got to the side, lift the tent, start, took my gloves off, started to undo my flies. Halfway through, I realized I have eight different layers to go through. Layer five, layer six, layer seven, layer... Boom! I peed. It was far too late. My fingers were frozen. I lost it. I peed all over myself and all over the tent. But it's okay. It's all right. They're all still asleep. Nobody's woken up, so nobody's going to know. And it's going to freeze within seconds anyway. So off I started rolling to the side of the tent, and I fell back into my alcoholic stupor. Two minutes later, there's absolute pandemonium, and the tent collapses. And there's a stampede of reindeer all over the tent, about 40 of them. And there's almost a fire, because we had this small fire going in the middle. And everybody's screaming, yelling, and I'm running backwards up this hill, not knowing what's going on, still drunk. And before I knew it, 40 reindeer start coming towards me. And they start licking me from head to toe. <laughs> I'm still drunk. It's the middle of the night, uh, and I had no idea what was happening. And then slowly, slowly, through the glare, I could see in the distance, people started to laugh. And one after the other, they all started to laugh and point, and they were in hysterics, laughing at me, being licked by all these reindeer going backwards up this mountain in the middle of the night in a storm. <laughs> what actually turned out was that reindeer love salt. They don't have any for 11 months of the year because of the snow and the ice. So any form of salt they can get hold of, they go for. And that night, they went for me. <laughs> but the most beautiful thing that happened, and the most unexpected thing, unexpected thing was that I made friends, in a way. I made a connection through laughter by making a complete and utter fool of myself unintentionally. The next day and the days thereafter, the relationship became warmer and warmer, and I was able to achieve the beginning of the photography that I was trying to make. And it was a fantastically uh, humble experience. But let's begin with why I was in northern Mongolia four years ago with frozen underwear. I have to take you back a little bit. Here I am at the age of seven. I've been traveling with my parents as an expat kid for many years. My father worked for International Shell, and they've decided I have to go to boarding school. They gave me a bag, a little British Airways bag, a passport, and a ticket, and they sent me off. So for the next years, I traveled backwards and forwards to my parents, wherever they were over the planet. And then at the age of 16, returning from one of my journeys from Africa, I was ill. I had cerebral malaria, and to be very honest, I think I was also stressed and a little sad to be leaving my parents. And I was at school. And one day, the doctor gave me some medicine, which turned out to be the wrong medicine. And the next morning, I woke up looking like this. All my hair fell out. It's a term called alopecia totalis. And I was confronted, this is a few years after 16, but the difference is quite profound. I didn't change. I was the same person. 
But every, how people started treating me changed, and that, that was a, a radical experience to realize that how you look can influence everything. So after a couple of years, I finished school. I'd had enough. I said, I'm taking myself away. I'm going to go to the one place on the planet where other people are bald. Shaved heads, to be honest. And that was Tibet. And I decided, well, unintentionally, I walked from one length to the other. And on that journey, I started making pictures. But the real journey was I was actually trying to find myself. And many, many, many years later, working as a photographer, to be honest, the real journey only started to begin four years ago. That's in a way when I truly find myself. I took myself off on a project. I decided I wanted to photograph 35 of the world's last cultures as art, as icons. And on that journey, something happened, something very profound. It went far beyond photography. I started to learn lessons, and three of those lessons I'd like to share with you today. The first lesson, I was in the Rift Valley, and far, far northern uh, uh, Kenya, on the, just near, near the ledge, uh, uh, edge of Lake Turkana. And I'd like to show you a picture and ask you a question. What do you see here? I see three fantastic, beautiful, elegant, tall people standing proudly in a landscape overlooking a valley. Often people say, they're women. And I say, well, look closer. They're men. They're not only men, they're warriors. They're Samburu warriors. And next to that, they can kill lions with their bare hands. When lions attack their camels, they go at them and they kill them. So here you are with this, these fantastically beautiful, tall, elegant, effeminate, they spend half the day running around looking in mirrors, playing with their bees and their hair and their skirts. <laughs> but on Sundays, they go out and kill lions with their bare hands. <laughs> so what am I trying to say? Look closer. Look closer. We in the developed world are very comfortable with our prejudices and with our judgments. Look closer, because you never know what's around the corner. Often things can be very different than they, they, they seem to be. The second lesson was one of choice. I'm now in Chukotka. I didn't know where it was either. It's in far, far northeastern Russia in Siberia. It's at the very end of the planet. And I'm looking for the Chukchi. The Chukchi are the last Russian Eskimos. So we arrived, we rented a tank, we got a guide, a Chukchi guide, and we said, when do we find them? When do we find them? He said, I don't know. It'll take a while, if we find them at all. I'll sit on the roof, it's minus 50 degrees centigrade, and we're going to follow the reindeer droppings. Fine by me. <laughs> off we go. Weeks and weeks later, literally, often with the cold coming in, minus 50 degrees outside, it was invariably minus 40 inside, we eventually found them. It was the most extraordinary experience. I've never experienced anything like that in my life, to be at the end of the world and eventually find the world's last people. There they were, the Yorangas, these fantastic uh, uh, tents in the distance, made out of reindeer skins. And we got out of the tank and, the tank, and these people enveloped us. They brought us in, and within seconds, we were part of their community. No names, no where, no what, no why. You're one of us, and we're going to look after you, because it's cold and you will die if you don't listen to us. After a week, we started a conversation. I turned to them and I said, you know, why are you living here? How did it come to be that you're living here at the end of the world? And they said, you know, we chose. We chose to be here. And I said, but how, how can you choose to be here? And they said, well, not so long ago, we were taken to a city and given an apartment block. And there we sat, and there we drank, and there we watched television. And we became very, very sad. We started not seeing our children, not seeing our old people. And we decided we were going to change. We were going to go back to where we came from. Because there we were happy. There we could feel how we were. And here we couldn't. So what am I trying to say? Even at the edge of the world, if you dare feel yourself, if you dare feel the environment you live in, if you dare feel one another, you know what will make you happy. And you have a choice, like these people did. And the last story, lesson I'd like to share with you is in uh, northwestern Mongolia in the Altai Mountains with these Hollywood heroes of mine, the Kazakh warriors, with these fantastic eagles with five-meter wingspans, traveling across these mountains. And I had, for years, I've dreamed of making pictures of these people. So off we went on another one of my little Jimmy exhibitions, started climbing in the mountain, and there we're standing with this cinemagraphic vista behind me with these three proud warriors. I'm getting excited. It's early in the morning. 
I stupidly, again, I still haven't learned my lesson, take off my gloves and I go for my old camera. My fingers freeze to it. In panic, I rip them off and I rip these fingers. I'm in pain. I'm in so much pain, I started to cry. I started to cry because I was emotionally upset, I was physically absolutely exhausted, and I couldn't feel my fingers anymore. And there before me was this image I'd spent my whole life wanting to make, and I couldn't make that picture. So I was stressed in the most extreme way. And I turned around, and behind me were two women who had followed us up the mountain. And one of them beckoned me over, and I sort of stumbled over like a spoiled child, screaming, oh, my fingers, my fingers. <laughs> And she opened a jacket and she grabbed me and she hugged me. And the other woman came from behind and they rocked me like a baby. And they rocked me to and fro and sang me a song. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, to say I started walking down the mountain, I got my picture, which you've just seen, selfish as always. And it was only then when I realized that these people, this is an Islamic culture, traditional Islamic culture. These people broke down all their values, all their culture, to help me. So by being vulnerable, by letting go, by being fallible, you can connect with people on any level. So what am I trying to say? I've given you three lessons of experiences I've had whilst making these photographs. First, the lesson is of judgment. Be careful when you look and judge somebody, because it's often different. The second is choice. We all have a choice, no matter what it is. And thirdly, I genuinely believe by being truly vulnerable, by truly feeling who you are and letting go, wherever you are on the planet, and people often ask me, how on earth do you communicate with these people? But that's by truly becoming naked in a metaphorical way. Don't get me wrong. You can communicate and get what you've done. So what am I trying to say? With these lessons, we have to wake up, yeah? We have to start documenting these cultures very, 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 very quickly because they're going to disappear. And as soon as they disappear, we will lose something which is very, very, very important to us. It's our authenticity. It's where we came from. It's our origins. And they will change. They will evolve. So we can't stop them. But we have to start a dialogue. We have to start a new conversation in how to access the information, what we can teach them and what they can teach us. So how I would like to do that is revisit them with a book myself and my team have just made. I would like to present it to them and show them why I was there, why I was running around screaming like a baby without gloves on, why I was peeing my pants, why I was making them into the icons, which I hope they now see. And with that, a message in what they can learn from us, in my opinion, and cultural and anthropological mistakes we've made, and vice versa, what can we learn from you in your way, and your purity, and your authenticity, and your beauty. And by doing that, I, with this dialogue, I want to readdress a balance, a balance which I feel we have lost. With this project of mine before, they pass away. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>